All right. I think we can get started. So hi, everyone. Welcome to this talk. Uh, it's titled Fantastic Ordinals and How to Avoid Them, Autoscaling Challenges in a Cloud Database. Uh, my name is Manish Gill, and I work for a company called ClickHouse. So I'm an engineering manager at ClickHouse. Uh, I work in a team which is the scale team. And the primary thing we do at ClickHouse is think about vertical and horizontal auto-scaling, uh, idling, scaling to zero. And we also heavily contribute to the ClickHouse operator in order to facilitate uh, the scaling mechanics. So this is the agenda for today. We're going to look at ClickHouse, the technology. Uh, we're going to talk about ClickHouse Cloud. We're going to talk about the auto-scaling architecture of uh, ClickHouse. We're going to look at vertical scaling specifically as a problem that we faced in ClickHouse and then uh, what the models of vertical scaling are, specifically what we call the break first model of scaling. Uh, then we're going to go into something we like to call make before break as an alternative approach. Uh, we're going to look at some, uh, like, uh, some nuances of how stateful sets work and the limitations of stateful set and how, are th how we dealt with the problems. OK, so ClickHouse. ClickHouse itself, uh, I don't know. Probably some people are familiar with it. It's an open source column oriented database. It's a distributed OLAP database specifically. So the workloads that ClickHouse typically runs are analytic, analytical in nature. Uh, it's got a reputation as being a really, really fast uh, database. So uh, most of the times, like you will see people running ClickHouse clusters with like uh, terabytes to petabytes of magnitude. And yeah, it's, uh, feel free to Google it. It's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, for the purpose of our talk, what's important is it's a distributed multi-master database, uh, and it's eventually consistent. And so whenever I'm talking about like pods or, rep or replicas in ClickHouse, uh, there is no such concept of a primary with the, like a, a replica in turn. So all replicas can in ingest traffic, and all of the replicas can serve queries. So like no one replica is special here. So ClickHouse Cloud is our serverless offering uh, of ClickHouse. Uh, we try to uh, make, uh, give you like a fully managed experience. You don't have to like deploy your own shared nothing architectures. Uh, it's serverless. It's got idling and auto scaling, and that's what uh, my team is responsible for. It's also got separation of compute and storage. So the storage layer in ClickHouse uh, turns out to be like as is the trend these days, uh, S3. So the actual data gets stored inside object storage. Uh, we are available in um, uh, two major cloud providers right now, AWS and GCP, and we have an uh, Azure offering coming soon as well. Uh, as you can see here, so we have the server pods running inside a ClickHouse instance, and these are the compute nodes. Uh, we also have PVCs attached to these nodes right now uh, because uh, we uh, still have some metadata pointing to that S3 data uh, on these PVCs. But we're slowly trying to get rid of these PVCs and eventually move to like a fully stateless model. That probably happens sometime soon. Uh, apart from ClickHouse Cloud, there's also like a bring your own key kind of a model where, uh, you know, for enterprise customers who probably don't want data to ever leave their VPN, uh, they can just provision uh, this entire data plane inside their own account and then, uh, you know, get the benefit of all the serverless offering inside. So uh, when you're managing a database on Kubernetes, the first thing you start out with is an operator, and that's kind of what we did as well. So here we can see a very simple uh, uh, like a specification of how an operator looks like. Uh, we have a custom resource inside of our Kubernetes clusters. This is the ClickHouse Cloud uh, cluster resource. Uh, that's being managed by the operator. Uh, this operator, in turn, is, uh, manage, uh, is creating and managing a stateful set. And this stateful set has uh, pods, uh, server pods 0, 1, and 2 with PVC attached to them. Uh, so this looks pretty familiar to most people, I, I hope. Okay, so now we understand the backdrop of uh, there's an operator, there are server pods. So let's talk, uh, talk a little bit about how, how autoscaling works. So there are specifically two sp uh, components uh, in any autoscaling infrastructure, so, and that's what we built ourselves as well. Uh, the first bit is the recommender, right? So autoscaling starts with the data. It starts with uh, metrics. So in this case, we can see from the left, uh, we have like ClickHouse itself exposes a lot of metrics uh, that we collect. Uh, we also have query log itself, which is actually accounting for uh, the memory that a particular query is going to take. And we are able to do this because actually ClickHouse keeps track of in its, no its own memory internally. We also collect kubelet metrics because that's important. That also gives us another view about like CPU utilization, et cetera. And all of this data gets collected inside a metrics database, which is coincidentally also a ClickHouse cluster. 
And the second half of this equation is the recommender. So this is a controller which is periodically running, looking at this data, and then making decisions about what should be the right size of any particular uh, cluster, right? So this is actually the component generating recommendations. And this is where the algorithm lives, right? So you can start with heuristics, and you can make it as complicated and as fancy as you want it to be. Uh, so the, any uh, smart and sophisticated uh, auto-scaling strategies that you want to do it, you probably want to do it in the recommender. So that's what we use as well. And so once you, have, once you have this pipeline flowing, you start from the metrics and then you go at the end, you have these recommendations being generated. How do you actually make use of them? How do you actually do, do auto-scaling based on these recommendations? So this is where the actual auto-scaling component comes in. So we have, as you can see from the left, we have like two inputs. One is the recommendations that get generated. The other is the user-defined limits, right? So users probably want to have like minimum and maximum limits to control their cost. And so those get accounted for inside these recommendations. So the recommender could probably say, hey, I would like this cluster. This cluster is just so memory intensive. I, I want this to be at like 100 gigabytes or something. But the user has like a max uh, uh, limit set. So we actually account for that as well. And this is where things get a little interesting. So once the autoscaler uh, detects that, hey, I actually have a cluster which is not rightly sized, and I want to kind of scale it up or scale it down, it's going to start doing pod evictions. And this is how it works inside the Kubernetes VPA as well, uh, which is uh, uh, the moment we, we detect that we need to do some uh, like uh, right sizing, we evict a pod and then we resize it. And this is how it looks like. So the autoscaler is going to like trigger this pod eviction. Uh, you can see the pod on the right here. And what's going to happen is a controller is going to come in, and in this case, it's just the stateful side controller. And this controller is going to resubmit that pod, which is very natural, we know that. And this is where the magic happens. Uh, so as soon as the pod gets resubmitted, uh, we have a mutating webhook. And this webhook is going to intercept that pod submission, and then it's going to mutate the resource request, right? So what happens here is that uh, the controller will, uh, will probably have its own idea of what the size should be, but the webhook, which is aware of the recommendation as well as the limits, is going to say, no, 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 you actually need to write it, uh, uh, size this pod according to this recommendation that I have. And so this is how uh, uh, you can actually size this pod, and we can see that in this case, the pod got sized to like a bigger size. So uh, we understand how the auto-scaling infrastructure works in general now, and this is, uh, uh, you know, anyone who knows VPA kind of knows this. We just happen to be building these components ourselves in order to get some more fine-grained control over how to do evictions, et cetera. So we don't use those out-of-the-box components. Uh, specifically in vertical scaling, this is kind of what we want, uh, right? So this is like an example of, you probably have like three server pods running with 16 gigs each, and you want to scale them up uh, to go to 32 gigs. And this is uh, like a fairly normal requirement for vertical scaling. And this is what we mean when we say vertical scaling is actually break first, right? So it's break first because you actually, like we just discussed, you have to evict a pod. And that eviction is like a restart, and that's causing a disruption to the customer's workload. So while we are actually trying to resize this customer, this pod is actually in the process of getting restarted. We have a PDB, which is uh, like uh, maximum and available is always going to be one. It's, uh, we don't do zero because that's kind of uh, unreasonable. Uh, so maximum and unavailable pods is just one. And so what happens there is that you resize these replicas one at a time, right? So you start from the last replica, you resize it. Uh, it takes its sweet time trying to come up. And then you uh, do the same thing with the second one and then do the same thing again. And at the end, you have like a scale-up operation that's complete. So this is pretty slow. Right, so and so, what happens is customers who want to like uh, kind of get the benefits of scaling, they complain that hey, the scaling is just not reactive, and this is the reason auto scaling in ClickHouse Cloud is sometimes not that reactive. The other problem that vertical scaling can cause is it can cause additional pressure on the remaining replicas. Right, so in this case, we can see that while this third replica is getting restarted. Uh, it's actually putting more pressure on the existing replicas. So you have this uh, like kind of tension here where you actually wanted to scale up because you wanted more resources. But what you ended up doing was in order to get those resources, you ended up taking away uh, the resources you had for some time. And in the worst scenario, what, what this can lead to is, is like these other replicas, they're just going to crumble under the load and they're just going to like get, start getting throttled, uh, maybe get oom killed or, uh, you know, those kind of things, and customers start to complain about this. So vertical scaling as it exists is kind of uh, a deal breaker. We want to move away from this model. Right, yeah, like I just said, it's slow, replaces one part at a time, it's disruptive. 
puts pressure, the remaining replicas get squeezed. And uh, one last thing is we actually maintain some overhead to kind of combat this. So in our recommendations, we account for this fact that, hey, actually, if you want to resize this replica to you know, some number, let's say 32 gigs, but we know that it's going to get squeezed. So let's like kind of uh, have some percentage as an overhead. And uh, that also means kind of the customer is actually, uh, the utilization uh, was, uh, the desired workload for the utilization was kind of lower, but just because of the nature of vertical scaling, we account for that in the overhead. That's kind of bad, right? We actually want to kind of reduce our overhead and get the customer's utilization should be as close to the allocation as possible. So uh, Kubernetes uh, experts will know that there is this cap uh, which allows for this uh, interesting new feature, which is in-place pod vertical scaling. Uh, this allows for resizing of pods in place. And this seems like a very convenient feature. There is actually no restart needed. Uh, and so why am I here talking about vertical scaling and this disruption when this feature already exists in Kubernetes? Uh, the last bullet point kind of gives it away, which is like, it's an alpha feature. There are some limitations to it. Uh, so we, prob we don't want to use it right now. But there is another important point, which is why we don't use it. And that's packing. Uh, my colleagues, Gianfei and Vinay, actually did a talk yesterday about how we are using most allocated scheduling strategy in, inside ClickHouse Cloud to pack uh, the pods as efficiently as possible. But this is kind of just to give you like a glimpse of what's happening here. So in this scenario, you have like three server pods running on a single node. And we can see there is some room for the, uh, the, the at least one pod to get resized in place without doing any sort of disruption, right? So let's see what happens. So yeah, there is enough room. And we can just resize this replica in place. And we're happy, right? Uh, but uh, this guy, again, this picture gives away the problem here in this situation, which is that now the node is actually full. Now there is no more space left uh, to kind of do any more further resizes or like uh, kind of increase the memory or the CPU of the, this node as well. Yeah, no room left for this pod. So uh, the idea here is that even though th this API exists in Kubernetes, you can kind of take advantage of this. You can do vertical scaling in place. It's actually best effort. It's never going to give you a guarantee that, hey, I will always do vertical scaling in place for you. It can also, you can just request to do vertical scaling in place. And this API can come in and it can, it can just reject that request. Right, And so the fundamental tension here is that packing efficiency, if you want to kind of optimize for cost and pack your pods as efficiently as possible, this is kind of uh, uh, like uh, working against this idea of doing in-place resizing. So you can either have like uh, in-place resizing with some buffer always, which means you are eating the cost, or you can pack as efficiently as possible. You probably don't want to have, you, you can't have both. Additionally, we actually have a homogeneous fleet, so there are no like low priority co-tenant workloads, like some sort of an API server or like different tiers of workloads running where we can kind of evict this low priority pod to make room for this other, uh, uh, like bigger, to kind of do in-place scaling. That's also not something that we do because we always want to pack as efficiently as possible. So now we come to uh, like this idea that in-place vertical scaling is not really working for us. Uh, default vertical scaling is kind of disruptive. So maybe we can do something better. And this is the approach that we've been calling make before break. And the name is also like there's a hint in there like how it works. You just have to make new replicas before you break the existing replicas. So here we can see example, we started with three different pods of uh, uh, 16 gigs each. Uh, you actually don't need to do anything. You just scale it out and you kind of leverage the horizontal scaling to kind of uh, get the additional capacity, right? Uh, so when you scale out, you get like a force replica. And because we have the mutating webhook that we discussed early on, uh, when this force replica gets submitted, it's always going to come up with like a bigger size. And then you can just break any of the existing three replicas. And now you have like a single cycle where one pod got resized without any kind of a disruption. You can also take this like one step further, like uh, for maybe like some customers would like to have like instant or like almost instant scaling. So you can just immediately double the capacity, right? So you can just have, hey, I have 16 gig replicas. I can just go from 16 to 32 gig replicas. And then I can just slowly uh, drain away my other older uh, replicas. And now I just have exactly what I wanted, which is three 32 gig rep gigs replicas. So what are the advantages of this approach, right? So it's fast, uh, we kind of know that there is no more restarting that's happening. Uh, like you're, you, the PDB is kind of not getting in your way. It's non-disruptive. Uh, there is no more pressure on existing pods because the existing pods can still continue to serve queries as safely as possible until they're kind of ready to go away. And because we have this, we can now reduce that extra overhead that we have been recommending. 
So now we're going to talk about like uh, stateful sets and why, why am I talking about stateful sets uh, specifically here? Because MBB as an approach, like it's great on paper, but it actually doesn't work with the practical realities of how stateful sets today exist in Kubernetes. And I'm going to explain how. So this is the scaling behavior of a single stateful set today in Kubernetes. It's always going to scale out from left to right. So, uh, and this is why actually the title of this talk is ordinals because you're going to start with ordinal zero and then you're always going to scale out, uh, like one, two, three, four, five. And as you can see, when you're doing like this three and four and five replicas, they're kind of like this make, so you can make arbitrary replicas inside the single stateful set. The problem is you cannot break the old replicas because if you follow the arrow in the inside the scale in, if you try to tell a stateful set, hey, I, I would like to have just three replicas, it's going to remove the three new ones you just created. And that's the opposite of what we want. We want to actually break replicas zero, one, and two. We don't want to break three, four, and five. So stateful sets are getting in our way. Like this is the default behavior. There is one uh, slightly hacky way in which you can achieve this. And this is the feature in stateful sets called start ordinal feature. Uh, it was introduced in this cap. And so the idea here is again, simple. So you start with three replicas, you just change the replica count to four, and then you get a make operation. That's fine. So that's, uh, you're happy with your make. And then you can just tell the stateful set, uh, hey, I would like you to start your ordinals from position one instead of position zero. And what this does is, uh, now you can just, what it means is that the pod zero is kind of going to get deleted, right? So, which is again, make before break. Why is this something we uh, like, you know, it, I said it's hacky. So why is that? It's hacky because you, you want the flexibility, right? You might have a backup running on replica zero and maybe replica one was the one you intended to break because, hey, uh, that one has enough, uh, like it doesn't have enough queries running on it or maybe you can drain it safely. Uh, so you're not getting the flexibility that you need. So you're always going to be uh, like breaking in this strict order. Think of it like a sliding window moving from left to right in which you're going to break this. So this feature is kind of works, kind of gives you what you need in terms of make before break, but not really what you wanted to use. You want the flexibility. Yeah, so breaking arbitrary pods. So we've kind of defined the problem here, right? So vertical scaling, uh, what, what are the problems there? We want to do make before break and make is fine, but we want to break these arbitrary pods. And we are not the first to face these problems. There are uh, like, you know, other projects out there which allow you to do selective pod deletion. Specifically, we looked at a few of them like advanced stateful sets by PinkCap and OpenCruise. And the key idea that all of these projects follow is this idea of delete slots. And I'm gonna explain what that is. Uh, so as you can see here in advanced stateful sets, the way it works is you can just specify the replica count as well as the delete slots in a, like uh, in an atomic operation. So when you do this, what happens is uh, you're starting through replicas because the, the controller has to maintain the replica count, it will make a new pod, which is the third pod that's uh, ordinal number three that's coming up. And because you also specify the delete slots, it's going to break the delete slot that you wanted it to do, right? So this does what you want it to do. So what's the problem here? Like, why did we not use this particular solution to do make before break? And the answer is really like, it was an experimental project. We did not want to take ownership of this code base. Uh, the default behavior is still falling back to ordinals. And my biggest gripe and my biggest complaint with this sort of solution is that I think ordinals are kind of just hard to keep track of when, you, when they have gaps in them. And I think this goes to the nature of ordinals, right? They are, or you kind of expect replicas to be in a continuous order. So when you're like an on-call engineer and you see replica 70, replica 72, and replica 73, you're going to ask the question, hey, what happened to 71? Is it in the delete slot? And you're gonna to have to do this mental math and look at the CR and see what's going on. And over time, especially with horizontal scaling inside and the mix, this is just going to get ugly, right? So we kind of, I started to think, okay, maybe we want to move away from this idea of ordinals altogether and look at a different solution. So OpenCruise, again, is, it's a separate project. It's got two different controllers. Uh, one is also coincidentally called advanced stateful sets. The other is called clone sets. So the OpenCruise advanced stateful set has the same uh, downsides that uh, I just mentioned about the pin cap controller. So we didn't really take a look at that very seriously. Clone sets were the interesting ones. They are actually supposed to be a replacement for deployments. 
but they support like volume claim templates, so you can do things like uh, a stateful, you can run stateful workloads on top of them. But notice here that the pod name is actually random, it's not ordered, and that was kind of where uh, I started to move towards that, hey, instead of ordering pods, maybe we just want randomness inside of our names and kind of treat everything equally, so there is no, server zero is not special, and there is no unintuitive behavior in terms of ordinals. This is what a clone set looks like. So you have like uh, uh, five pods running. The one I've highlighted in bold here, like, uh, you can just select and delete that. You can just add it to the spec, and this will get deleted. And the key thing to remember here is that the operation of reducing the replica count as well as adding uh, the break pod to the set, that has to be atomic, because otherwise you'll just get, get a new pod popping back up to maintain the, the original replica count. But yeah, so this kind of does what we want, which is selective pod deletion. You just have to like follow this spec and then you will break any arbitrary pod that you want. The catch with clone sets was actually specifically not with their arbitrary pod deletion, but with their pod update strategy. So clone set actually supports like recreate strategy as well as in place pod updates. And uh, where we got stuck was just uh, uh, PVC deletion as well as PVC recreation. So when you recreate a PVC, when you update a pod, uh, the clone set controller is always going to recreate the PVC. And that's not what you want for a database workload. You actually, uh, and so the only thing you're left to do is do in place updates. The catch there is if you do in place updates, you actually can't modify your resources or even update your environments. So you get a choice. You either can resize your pod or you can retain your PVC. You can't do both. And that was kind of like a, a, a place where we got stuck and clone sets were just, we wanted to have the best of both worlds, right? So we can't have that with clone sets. Okay, so we've looked at a few solutions and we realized, okay, no popular active out of the box solution is going to work for us for various reasons that we discussed. Uh, and this is like a quick recap of our requirement. We want a stateful set or something like a stateful set. Uh, we would like to move away from ordinals. Uh, delete slots are a good idea, so we want that. We want to retain our PVCs. We want to respect the disruption budget for things like upgrades. We still want to have that. And I'm going to talk about topology spread constraints later because they get pretty important once we go towards our solution. And so the idea was we can just use the stateful sets, just use them in a different way. So this is what we call multi-STS. And it's very simple. Uh, the vanilla stateful set is pretty powerful. We can leverage it. Uh, the very interesting property that the stateful set gives us is that we can still have operator downtime, right? So the operator is the code that we are changing almost every day while we're developing it. And if we wanted to kind of directly manage our pods inside the operator, we would have to kind of risk the fact that we could introduce bugs inside of our operator, and the cost of that will be pretty high, right? So imagine like you're writing code which is kind of doing something with a pod, and the pod gets kind of accidentally deleted or something. That's not what you want to do. So the stateful set is a battle-tested controller, so we wanted to leverage that. And the other thing is it's relatively easy to go from like one thing to many things inside your code base just in terms of refactoring. Instead of introducing like a new custom resource, like an advanced stateful set or a clone set, and then doing a migration. Remember, we still had customers running on the single SDS. So we had to migrate, which, is, which can be like a whole separate talk of its own, from like single SDS to this multi-SDS model. But yeah, so the key idea here is just use one stateful set per pod. And this is what it looks like, right? So this is the, the same image from the beginning. You have a sing, the operator creating a stateful set, managing three pods. But now we can just do this. So we have like three different stateful sets, each of them with a random suffix. Uh, so when you have these suffix and then you can kind of implement your own delete slots and then you will have the ability to kind of make new replicas as well as break any arbitrary replicas and you can achieve make before break vertical scaling without any of the problems that we discussed before. Yeah, so this is just a quick recap of what it looks like. So you have three stateful sets managing three parts. Uh, you do a make. The fourth part comes in, it's, a, it's like a, a bigger one. Uh, we introduce something like a condemn step, and this is kind of an intermediate pot, uh, step where the pod is marked for deletion. And this is done mostly for database reasons where uh, ClickHouse, it's not really trivial to immediately get rid of a replica and the database figures everything out automatically. You have to do some sort of synchronization operations. Not very many, but there are still a few steps you have to do. So inside the operator code path, you actually condemn the replica first, do this synchronization, and then you break that replica. 
And so this is the way we achieve make before break. And again, all the benefits that I just described previously, you can do instant uh, scaling, uh, uh, no disruptions. You can do like uh, your performance is great now. So the requirements for implementing multi-STS were not very many, but still worth talking about. Uh, we needed stable identities. So this is something that the ordinals kind of give you always. So pod zero is always going to be pod zero. If you remove it, it's always going to come back with the same name. And this stable identity is important for your uh, you know, host name as well as PVC name, other reasons. Uh, the way we do it is we kind of start to manage the state inside the operator ourselves and uh, kind of use the stable identity uh, for the random suffixes that we are generating as well. You have to do horizontal scaling, which, is, uh, which was fairly trivial uh, to do in terms of scaling out. Scaling in is where some of the challenges uh, came into place. I'm gonna talk about them. Uh, rolling updates, you kind of get for free because the pod disruption budget actually works on top of label selectors. So it doesn't matter if one stateful set is managing the pod or many stateful sets. As long as you have the right labels, you're still going to get your PDB. And again, topology spread constraints, I'm gonna talk about them specifically because that was the one area where we ran into a lot of challenges. And the only new feature that you're really adding here is the delete slots. So topology spread constraints and what were the problems with it? Uh, inside ClickHouse Cloud, just to set the context, if you have like a service with three different replicas running, all the three replicas are going to be placed in different zones. And of course we do this for availability reasons. And what happens when you try to do like make before break with topology spread constraints? So here we have an example of we have like Initially, we have two pods, A and B, and now we want to make two new pods. We can do that, and these two pods will go into zone C. So A, B, and C here are availability zones, and A, B, C, C is actually just a valid topology. The problem comes now when we actually want to break those old replicas, right? So what happens when you break A and B? You actually have both of the, uh, the remaining replicas inside zone C, and now your zone C becomes a single zone uh, point of failure, and it's actually not a valid topology if you have your max Q set to one. Another problem we ran into with uh, topology spread constraints in MBB was the fact that we actually, like I mentioned earlier, we actually have idling inside ClickHouse Cloud as well. So when you idle a cluster, you actually have uh, three stateful sets. The pods are not scheduled anymore, but the PVCs are still lying around. So when the stateful set controller uh, sets the desired uh, count to one again, uh, these pods will wake up, they will get scheduled, and then they will reattach to this, these PVCs, right? But you can have a situation where a customer wants to add a new replica before their cluster wakes up. So you can imagine I have three replicas before, but before, uh, and my cluster is idling, I can just dial like a, a setting in my uh, UI and just say, please give me four replicas when you wake up. And this is where a race condition happens, where the stateful set controller can just Im immediately schedule the new replica, but the old one can sometimes take its sweet time to come back up. And when that happens, you can have a race here because the stateful set controller only takes the scheduled pods into account when making the decision about zone placement, right? So you can see here, like you have, like the initial two pods are in zones A and B, and the third, the, the new replica that came in, it also came in with zone A because the only uh, consideration we had while we were making the decision about the zones was A and B. We actually never looked at this replica marked in red because we never took the PVCs into account. And that's something, I think this is also true for the default stateful set. But this situation actually would not have happened with default stateful sets because it will, if you remember the arrow that we, we, we were going from right to left, uh, if we were to kind of do like a replica count, reduce it to two, it will remove CC. So this situation is avoidable with stateful sets, not with MBB. But this one I think is still kind of something, I, I might have to test that, but I think this race condition also exists with the stateful set controller today. So uh, there are all these uh, problems that we ran into with uh, topology spread constraints. And really the way to solve them was kind of do zone pinning, which is kind of, we started to uh, decide uh, which availability zone a pod is going to get placed into. And this, this logic kind of is now living inside our operator where the operator makes the, the decision about which zones to uh, place the pod into. And because uh, like previously, like we mentioned, like uh, it wasn't taking PVCs into account, the operator can kind of just do that. So we count the PVCs, figure out what's the zone balance, and then decide which zone to place the pod into. So yeah, long story short, uh, we have like uh, breaking arbitrary pods. It does not work naturally with topology spread constraints. So that's the only catch if you would like to implement make before break yourself. Uh, 
and the same reasoning also applies with horizontal scaling. So your scaling in operations have to be zone aware. So just keep that in mind. The scheduler, like I said, is not really aware of existing PVCs. It's only aware of scheduled pods. So uh, we've covered all this. And so why am I talking about make before break multiple stateful sets? And like, you know, we ran into these problems, but we are not really the first ones. Stateful services on Kubernetes is hard. I'm sure many of you here know this already. Cloud native PG, which is a very famous uh, Postgres operator, uh, also decided to write a custom controller to manage the pods themselves. Uh, Strimzy, actually, hi the highlighted section here mentions the exact reason that we have, which is uh, you know the ordinals are a problem when you want to do any arbitrary pod deletion inside a stateful set. Strimzy, for, th for those of you who don't know, it's a Kafka uh, operator for Kubernetes. So yeah. It's like uh, not a new problem, but the stateful set controller just doesn't give us the flexibility that we need. So uh, just a recap over what we've covered so far. Vertical scaling for stateful services, it can be very slow, it can be disruptive. Database workloads are kind of important. You don't want to, you want to be very, very careful about this. In place pod resizing is a tempting feature. Does not always work if you want to pack as efficiently as possible. The stateful sets are not really as flexible as we would like them to be. You can't do arbitrary pod uh, deletion. And uh, a work, uh, the solution to this is something like that we have been calling make before break. You can try to use it. Delete slots, because making again is easy. Breaking is uh, the hard bit here. And so we've been using delete slots to kind of facilitate breaking of arbitrary replicas. And you can use third party controllers that we discussed, such as clone sets or advanced stateful sets, if you kind of don't want to go too much into writing your own code. We had that bandwidth, I guess. So we were able to kind of implement this multi SDS approach. But of course, you can always use these third party controllers. Be mindful of the caveats that I discussed. And yeah, topology issues are the ones that you need to be very, very careful about uh, when we're doing this kind of thing. That is what I have for you today. Thank you so much. Uh, we are hiring, so come talk to me if you are interested in these problems. Thank you. Yeah, so if anyone has questions. Hey, Manish, uh, very interesting uh, story on how you went through all these different things uh, with the scaling. One uh, important thing, uh, does your operator now, because we didn't see much about the limits and requests uh, in, in this context, right? We are talking about just the scaling part. So in your case, for your stateful sets or for your databases, now how do you um, have your limits and requests? Do you have a fixed reservation? Yeah, or? so our limits are all, always equal to the request. We have like a quality of service guaranteed. Okay, so that makes your life easy, but not all stateful sets would be like that. So we actually have forever ClickHouse Keeper. So we uh, didn't mention this, but ClickHouse uses uh, its own like a Zookeeper replacement called ClickHouse Keeper. Uh, and inside the Keeper stateful set, we actually have a, a recently set burstable CPU. So the limits are actually different. Can work, I think. So in that case, also now you go through all these things uh, to schedule the. No, next no, no. One? So this is we do this only for the server pods. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you.